All right, we're in a unit here uh, examining the experience of African Americans in the Gilded Age, the broadest possible definition of the Gilded Age from 1865 to 1929, the advent of the Depression. We've already talked about uh, Reconstruction, did a quick review of that, uh, which tells us about the experience of African Americans from 1865 to the um, Compromise of 1877. Uh, let's talk about what happens after that. The rise of Jim Crow refers to um, <clears throat> a complex system of, of institutionalized uh, racial discrimination, institutionalized in the laws of the South. And there's a lot of relevant legal material, but two, two uh, Supreme Court cases were particularly important. First was called the Civil Rights Cases uh, of 1883. Uh, it was five similar cases heard together, and, and the decision was called Civil Rights Cases of 1883. Uh, basically, it was civil rights issues regarding uh, discrimination and use of public accommodations, basically. Um, and essentially, uh, the court held that Congress lacked the constitutional authority under the enforcement provisions of the 14th Amendment to outlaw racial discrimination by private individuals and organizations. Uh, it also uh, declared the Civil Rights Act of 1875, passed by the Radical Reconstruction Congress, uh, unconstitutional. You'll recall that act said that all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States shall be entitled to full and equal enjoyment of the accommodations, advantages, facilities, and privileges of ends, public conveyances on land or water, etc. It declared that unconstitutional. So basically, uh, it blunted the power of the 13th and 14th Amendments and um, set up a, a framework for uh, uh, discrimination and segregation. There was one dissenting justice, uh, Justice John Marshall Harlan. Um, he was a, a, a constantly dissenting these kinds of decisions. He was called the great dissenter. He served on the court for 33 years, from 1877 to 1911, sixth longest ever. He was nominated by Hayes, uh, and interestingly, his, his nomination, uh, while it passed the Senate, was opposed by the stalwart Republicans, which tells you that he was a fairly reform-minded person. The second really important case um, is Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, decision came down in 1896. Uh, it's about a, a guy named Homer Plessy. Um, and uh, in 1890, Louisiana, the state of Louisiana, passed something called the Separate Car Act. It said you had to have separate white and black uh, rail cars. And there was a group of concerned citizens um, of mixed race, uh, and they um, they wanted to contest this with a test case, and so they talked to a guy, one of their members named uh, Homer Plessy, into into being the um, the victim here. Um, he was actually born a free man and was considered uh, an octoroon, an antiquated term, which meant he was one eighth black. He bought, but but according to Louisiana state law, he was black. You have one drop of black blood, you're black. He bought a first class ticket. And the railroad immediately, that uh, they were kind of wise to this protest, they immediately arrested him. Uh, he um, protested. Uh, the state of Louisiana sided, of course, uh, against him, and it went to the Supreme Court. And they decided, as well, in this very famous, infamous, really, case uh, that set up the separate but equal doctrine. You can have separate facilities, you can require separate facilities for black and white as long as they're equal. Of course, they never will be equal. Uh, and that'll be the thing that breaks it down, but not until 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, famous case we'll talk about uh, in our next phase of the American experience in African Americans. Now, these two cases uh, effectively um, blunted the power of the 13th and 14th Amendment. The 15th Amendment was under assault, too. Excluding blacks from voting uh, began almost immediately uh, as Reconstruction ended. But in the 1890s, uh, it, it, it efforts became much more vigorous, um, and for several reasons. One, as you know, progressives in general uh, were trying to clean up, quote-unquote, the voting process, and that was disenfranchising ethnic minorities in the North. That was part of it. And also, um, conservative elites, the Redeemers, feared a union of poor whites and blacks. And in fact, some populists were trying to do that. So the 1890s saw a huge effort to get around the 15th Amendment. Uh, poll taxes or property qualifications uh, and a literacy or understanding test were some ways uh, to disenfranchise people. Although they were applied unequally to blacks and whites, they did affect poor white voters as well as blacks. Um, and so something called grandfather laws were passed. Um, grandfather laws basically said um, you can vote if your grandfather voted here before uh, 1865. Well, obviously, no black person's grandfather uh, voted before 1865. Um, 
Educational segregation and disenfranchisement were just the beginning. A whole system of state statutes, known as Jim Crow laws, institutionalized a very elaborate system of segregation, uh, deference and, the deference and subjugation of the old rural South was extended to the new urban South. Um, and, and Jim Crow was not just laws, it was also uh, terror, uh, which reinforced white supremacy. In the 1890s saw a significant increase in white violence against blacks. Uh, there were approximately 187 lynchings a year, 80% of them in the South. Now lynching we think of as, as um, uh, hanging people by a mob, but it, 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 means, it means death by any way, by any means. Uh, hanging is, is a common one. Lynching did shock a lot of whites, um, and there was an anti-lynching movement. The, the great uh, uh, muckraking reformer Ida B. Wells uh, in 1892 uh, began a significant push to get a federal anti-lynching law uh, to do what state and local governments were unwilling to do. But shared commitment to white supremacy among whites uh, prevailed. So was there anything good happening for African Americans? Uh, yeah, there was, sort of. Um, blacks bought into the New South idea of Henry Grady uh, as well as whites, many, and many elevated themselves to the middle class. Uh, it was an inferior to, uh, middle class, the white middle class. Um, but nevertheless, there was slow advancement uh, by acquiring property, by owning businesses, or entering professions. Obviously, these business and professions served other blacks black doctors to serve blacks, black nurses, and so on. Um, a, a woman that typifies this is, is uh, called Maggie Lena Walker, Maggie L. Walker. Uh, she was um, a very famous person uh, in Richmond, Virginia. Maggie Walker was uh, born to a former slave in Richmond, and she eventually became a school teacher. Uh, but when she was, uh, before that, when she was 14 years old, she joined uh, the local council of the Independent Order of St. Luke. This was a fraternal burial society, sort of a, uh, a self-help society, not unlike a settlement house. And when she um, became an adult, she became very involved with this organization and expanded its services. In 1902, she established a newspaper called the St. Luke Herald. Shortly thereafter, she chartered the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank, uh, and she served as the bank's first president, which uh, is pretty interesting. It earned her the recognition of being the first woman to charter a bank and, and be its president in the United States. Not only was she the first woman, she was also an African-American woman. Later, she agreed to serve as chairman of the board of directors when the bank merged with two other banks. Uh, and this consolidated bank and trust company grew to serve generations of, of uh, African-American uh, 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 Richmond uh, citizens. Um, this is her house uh, in Richmond, which I've been to. It's, it's a nationally designated historic site. Uh, it commemorates her um, as a, a prototypical example of uh, uh, first Afri African-American middle-class uh, citizens. Now, this African-American middle-class greatly valued education, uh, and, and two promoters of this were Booker T. Washington, uh, and W.B. Du Bose, and they express two really very different approaches to how blacks uh, should, um, uh, should behave uh, in America. Washington said that blacks should go to school uh, and establish solid footing uh, in agriculture and the trades. In other words, they should focus on practical, not classical education. Now, bear in mind this is what uh, a lot of progressive reformers and realist thinkers were saying uh, in the wider world. Uh, uh, Dewey, the, uh, the educator Dewey, was saying that we need more labs, more math, more science, less classic classics education. Um, and so uh, Booker T. Washington, of course, was a proponent of these agriculture and mechanical uh, historically black uh, universities. Um, and uh, he also said that blacks should adopt the appearance and values of the white middle class. Uh, this would help them grow in, in economic power and eventually in political power, but there should be no political agitation. He expressed these ideas in an 1895 speech uh, in Atlanta. It's known as the Atlanta Compromise or Atlanta Compromise Speech, in which he basically says, look, we need to learn, uh, to, we need to learn trades, professions, and, and get ahead economically. That's the best thing we could do for ourselves as African Americans, and we'll worry about the political stuff later. Now, W.B. Du Bois was a very different thinker. He, he recoiled, in fact, openly, was hostile to uh, this Atlanta Compromise. He said, no, uh, 
Uh, blacks should agitate now for political rights, for enfranchisement, for their share of American democracy. And what's wrong with a black man uh, learning Greek and Latin uh, if that's what he wants to learn? Uh, and so these two men, both revered civil rights leaders, had rather different approaches and represent two different um, sort of avenues for uh, uh, African Americans to rise.